Our first scripture reading comes to us this morning from Isaiah 12, 2 through 6. God is indeed my salvation. I will trust and won't be afraid. Yea, the Lord is my strength and my shield. He has become my salvation. You will draw water with joy from the springs of salvation, and you will say on that day, Thank the Lord, call on God's name, proclaim God's deeds among the peoples. Declare that God's name is exalted. Sing to the Lord who has done glorious things. Proclaim this throughout all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, city of Zion, because the Holy One of Israel is great among you. Our second scripture reading comes to us from Luke 3, 7 through 15 and 18. Then John said to the crowds who came to be baptized by him, You children of snakes, who warned you to escape from the angry judgment that is coming soon? Produce fruit that shows you have changed in your hearts and lives. And don't even think about saying to yourselves, Abraham is our father. I tell you that God is able to raise up Abraham's children from these stones. The axe is ready at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be chopped down and tossed into the fire. The crowds asked him, What then should we do? He answered, Whoever has two shirts must share with the one who has none, and whoever has food must do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. They said to him, Teacher, what should we do? He replied, Collect no more than what you are authorized to collect. Soldiers asked, What about us? What should we do? He answered, Don't cheat or harass anyone, and be satisfied with your pay. The people were filled with expectation, and with many other words, John appealed to them, proclaiming good news to the people. I have good news for you this morning. God gave me two complete sermons for you. And the really good news is I'm going to only share one of them with you this morning. You have to wait for the other one for another day, maybe even next year. So today we are just focusing on Isaiah. You take a deep breath. You're going to make lunch on time. It's all going to be good. All right. So Isaiah is a prophet. Excellent. Remember, I like responsive preaching. So I'm going to say the thing, you're going to give the answer. Uh, so Isaiah is a prophet. He is different than Jeremiah and Baruch, who we heard about last week. And he addresses an exile different than the one that Baruch talked about last week, which tells us that the Israelites went through more than one exile. How fun is that? Right? And what is an exile? banished, kicked out. You can't stay home. You can't go to your temple. You're foreign people in a foreign land. From exile, we also learn the term diaspora, which is sort of far flung, kind of like, uh, well, I won't use that analogy. Anyway, um, so you're sort of kicked out and you're dispersed all over. That's diaspora. That's what the exile is. And it often comes, generally comes as a result of war. Right? Some people group, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, those are the ones that mostly come to mind. They push the Israelites out of the promised land, out of the land of Israel, and they take over. It's called an occupation, right? This is our land now. These are our houses now. These are our farms now. These are our hills now. These are our wells now. They take over, and the Israelites are left 
to figure it all out, start from scratch in a new place, in a foreign place with new people that they don't know, with sometimes foods or herbs or things they don't understand, a landscape they aren't comfortable with, and farms that maybe are this big instead of this big, right? Exile is generally not a happy time. It's a time of frustration, of dislocation, of separation, of difference, of sort of disorientation. And so they're in this time of exile. And I will say this, that in our time of pandemic, I find a lot of resonance with the Israelites in exile. Now, we are not under occupation. We have not been kicked of our, out of our homes or out of our lands. But those feelings of dislocation, disorientation, isolation, separation, brokenness, those for me have been very real in the pandemic. Anybody else? So when I hear about the Israelites, I sort of have this sympathetic, empathetic connection with them of like, I know what it feels like to be disoriented. I think we all do, right? It seems a little bit further off now that we're at this stage of the pandemic, but I want you to think back to March 2020, April 2020, lockdown, right? A lot of not knowing how does this virus operate? What do we need to do? We're masked this morning, but at that time, we didn't know what the recommendation was on masks. There were some people saying masks, some people not, and it sort of went back and forth. What should we do? And we sort of like took the strictest approach possible, which is the medical approach of like sort of pull back from everything you can until we know more. And we went like lost in the darkness in a new place or a new house, right? Wait. <laughs> But if I can't go to the grocery store, then what do I do? And if I can't send my kids to school, then what do I do? And if I can't go to worship on Sunday, what do I do? And if I can't sit for a meal with my family, then what do I do? And if I can't go to a, a, a restaurant, or am I allowed to go to the doctor? I can't go to the doctor. How do I do telehealth? Anybody learn how to do telehealth? This completely disorienting experience where we sort of were lost in the desert of our own within the pandemic of not knowing, of disruption and dislocation and disorientation. That's been our exile experience. And it's been hard and we've sort of figured out a way, but still we long for what was before. Yes? Yes, we long for the routines that we don't even have to think about, where we can just sort of march into life and it's just easy. Who wants things to be easy again? <laughs> I don't even want to have to think about all of these things. Do you know that I had more than an hour of conversation over multiple days about those, the candles for Christmas Eve? More than an hour of conversation because what do we have to do after we pass the light of Christ? You have to blow them out. In the middle of a pandemic with a new variant in masked worship, this was a legitimate conversation for us. I want to do things that I don't have to think about. I want to go back to that time when things are easy and safe and I can just like be and do, that's what the Israelites wanted. And they may do. They got stuck in exile generally for more than 40 years. Generations, decades of time, they're stuck in that land of difference. And so when you've been there long enough, you learn to adapt and we make do, right? We know our new customs. We knew our new rituals. On your way into the church building, what do you do? You pull your mask from your pocket, from your car, from your purse, whatever it is, because we know the new normal. And you walk in, you find the hand sanitizer, and you scrub your hands, you say hello, you go to greet somebody new, and you go, well, maybe not. Just kidding, right? It's nice to meet you. I don't shake hands. Do you shake hands? Can I have a hug? Right? We've learned. And even though there's still lots of unknowing, we've sort of learned the dance of not knowing with each other within the pandemic. We've adapted. People are wonderful. They're adaptable. They're resilient. We kind of wish we weren't because we just want the thing that's familiar, but we can adapt. And that's what the Israelites did. They adapted in exile. They learned new ways. We don't have our land. We don't have our farms. We don't have our animals. We don't have our house. We don't have our people. Okay, but we're not coming back to them tomorrow, so we're going to figure it out. They figured out how to do life. They figured out how to adapt. They figured out how to make the best of it. And they settled in. 
for a long time. So long that there were multiple generations who lived out of exile. There were people who went into exile from the promised land who would never return to the promised land because they passed. They would never see the other side of the exile here on earth. There were other people who lived in exile who did that adaptive work and settled in. And then when finally the exile was nearing the end and they said, no, you get to go back to Israel. We're going to pack up and we're going to go. They're like, mm. no, I'm not starting from scratch again. I don't want to uproot my whole family again, start over again. I'm not going. There are people who said, I'm not moving again. I found my place, I found my way, and this is it. Enjoy. Right? And then there's people who said, no, the promised land is our land. We are going back. And they carried new babies with them. Babies that had never been in the promised land. Babies that had never seen those places. Toddlers that had never seen those places. Adults, young adults that had never seen those places. As my daughter pointed out to me this morning, I sat down after the first sermon, and she goes, because we talked about 40 years, right? She says, you're 40. Yeah. And what if I had been born in the exile? And my parents, now grandparents, say, yes, we're going, we're going back to the land we know. And I'm like, I don't know that land. I don't know that place. No, get excited. Let's go. Why am I getting excited for something I've never seen before? Right? Imagine the different ages and stages and generations who have lived through this exile now being invited to go back to the promised land. And what we don't read this morning, the first 11 chapters of Isaiah, are the prophet telling them, like, kind of like Baruch, get excited, it's coming. There's something to look forward to. There's something to anticipate. There's something to work towards. Get ready. Because there is another side. There is something other than exile. There is something other than diaspora. And it is back in God's promised land. And then what we hear today is a hymn of praise. And when we get there, you're going to sing. When we get there, you're going to testify. When we get there, you're going to praise God. When we get there, it's going to be good. And you are going to celebrate and it's going to be wonderful. And we need that. We just talked about it last week, but we need that reminder, right? We need that continued hope. There is another side to the pandemic. There is something other than exile. There's something other than dislocation and estrangement and disruption in our lives. And we will be able to dream. And so you begin to dream. What's it going to be like when we get together? I mean, really get together without the masks, without the restrictions, without the ribbon on the pews. What's it going to be like? How are we going to do it? To show you how naive we were back in April of 2020, we were thinking that by May we'd be back together as church. This is when I served in Moscow. I'm sure you were in something similar, right? It's not that far away. May, May of 2020, we're going to get back together. And the song that came to me is this old school. It might be a spiritual. It might just be old school. And I'm not really a singer, so I won't sing it really full out. But it, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Right? We know it, sort of. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. So we changed the words a bit so we could sing it for our church. When we all get together, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all share Jesus... We'll sing and shout the victory. And I kind of thought we'd be singing that in May of 2020 when we all came back together and that it was going to be fun and exciting like the day of resurrection when we're with all the saints and we're celebrating. It's going to be that good. And then we waited. And then we waited some more. And then we waited because that's the nature of a pandemic and that's the nature of exile. But the prophet is sure that there is something good coming. And he says, and on that day, you will say, on that day, you will celebrate. You will praise God and you will testify. Now, in part, hearing that is like a carrot, right? Like we can claim it. I will sing again. 
right? I will worship without a mask on. I will hug my friends at church. I will bring my favorite dish to the potluck, right? I'm going to, it's like name it and claim it, right? I am going to name it and claim it. It will be true. I will do those things. It's a carrot of hope held out before us. And it is something else. It's an invitation to learn and relearn the liturgy. And when you get there, you will say, and those words are a word of praise and worship for God. So part of what I learned as I was studying this passage is where it says, verse three or four, it's for three of what we have. You will draw water with joy from the springs of salvation. And you will say on that day, thank the Lord, call on God's name, proclaim God's deeds among the people. That section right there that says you will draw on, you will draw water with joy from the springs of salvation. We hear that as just like you're going to go to the well or the spring and you're going to draw water. But it's actually a hearkening to a liturgy of celebration within the Jewish tradition. And it was known as this big sort of high holy day, feast day, that had this celebration. And the priest would go and collect water from the spring and then do a dance. And I don't dance either. Um, but they would do a dance. And it was this ritual to behold. And everybody wanted to be there to see it because it was so good and so beloved and so cherished that it was sort of highlighting this piece of liturgy. And when you go and when you see them draw the water and do the dance and say the liturgy, you're going to say these things too. It's like when I say God is good and you say all the time and I say all the time and you say God is good. Now, six months ago, you didn't know that, right? I said, God is good. And you're like, mm -hmm. right? I, I taught you God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. In some ways, the prophet was teaching the people, the people that had been in exile, that hadn't learned the words of liturgy, that didn't know all the songs. When the priest says this, you do that. When the pastor says this, you respond like that. The liturgy has been somewhat close to us and yet somewhat far, right? Watching online is not the same experience. It's beautiful and wonderful and something that we will absolutely 100% keep embracing. And there's a difference between it and being in a pew. There's a difference between sitting on a couch at home and sitting in a sanctuary. And I'll tell you, as somebody who has lots of chaos at home, when we watched online, the dogs would wrestle in the middle of the floor and the kids would jump from couch to couch and somebody needs a snack and somebody needs a drink and you move this. Anybody else with me? Some of you have such quiet homes. Give God thanks for that. You just say, Praise Jesus that I could worship in a way that allowed me to focus. And some of us are like juggling flaming torches while we're trying to worship from home. It's all right. We have our own experiences. Um, but there's, there's ritual for us to learn and relearn. There's rhythms in worship for us to practice and engage with. And there's this whole other basket of work. Now, I want you to think about the Israelites. They're finally returning from exile to the promised land, which some of them know and some of them don't. Some of them know where the family plot is, right? Where the house was, where the farm was, where they kept the sheep, where they kept the goats. Some of them know that. Some of them have no clue. And they, in their minds, have been imagining this thing that was. And then they go to that land, and the house that they always lived in has been converted or burned down. And the place where they always used to take their sheep to water is now dried up. Are you with me? Do you understand what I'm saying here? That the thing that used to be is no longer. And so they get to this promised place. And do you know what they have to do? Work so hard. They have to restore their farms. 
They have to rebuild their homes. They have to reclaim their lands. For, and for some of them, it's just work. It just feels like work. And for some, it's exciting work because the family home that was always right here, it was a great little house. But it was so far from the water over there that you had to like trek an extra, remember, there's no indoor plumbing, right? You have to trek an extra time to take your urn to get the water to bring it home. And so since it's not there, people are like, well, we should put it there because it's always been there. And somebody's like, well, that's nice for you, but you weren't the one hauling water. So as the one who's hauling water, my vote is that it's over here because that makes more sense, right? And within our life in the church, we have some choices like that to make too. The thing that always was that was just here and was reliably here, some of those things have been torn down. Some of those things have been bowled over. Some of them are just sort of lying there vacant. And when we go, well, what should we do? Somebody's like, well, we should do it here. We go, but why? Why do we do it here? Well, because we've always done it here. Okay, that's fair enough. But let's, let's just take another look. If what we're trying to do is fulfill these values, if, if what we're trying to do is grow spiritually, if what we're trying to do is build community, if what we're trying to do is live faithfully, if what we're trying to do is reach those who aren't here, I mean, just for example's sake, right? If, we, if that's what we're trying to do, then maybe doing that thing over there like we've always done it isn't the best choice. Maybe we need to look at it with new eyes. Maybe we need to ask some different questions. Maybe we need to sort of call on our core values that dictate what we do and why we do it to decide what we're doing next. That's the work of rebuilding. That's the work of after the exile or after the pandemic. Is It's not just going back to what we always knew. It's recognizing that what was isn't what it was. Some of it's there and sturdy and reliable, and some of it isn't. And for all of us, we are invited. We get to not have to. We get to say, well, what do we do? And why do we do it? And is that what makes the most sense for us? Do we have the resources, the people, the time, the energy to do it that way? Or do we need to reimagine it? And where we were super excited to get back <laughs> to the promised land, to God's place, we better be real clear that it comes with a huge responsibility. There is work to be done. And it's reimagining work. It's recreating work. It's re-envisioning work. It's talking about, well, what matters to you? Well, what matters to you? Well, what gives you life? Well, what gives you life? What about those people who don't even want to come into the building? What gives them life? What would matter and be significant to them? And how do we build our faith life together around those things? Now, some of that work is already happening. And like I said, we take hours to talk about Christmas Eve candles. And we have conversations about things like what you do not see here, the Advent wreath. We've got the candles, but not the wreath. How many of you noticed that? There's no wreath this year. They're stealing all my traditions. They don't do the things that they're supposed to do. We have those conversations too. We do not take those decisions lightly because we know that some of you are going to argue with us. And so we say, well, what is the significance of the Advent wreath? Who knows? To celebrate Christ. That is always a good church answer. To celebrate Christ. But why do we need the wreath? Y'all know? The circle of love. I love that. Do you know that the wreath is actually not an original part of the Advent candles? I didn't know. I had no idea. Why do we need a wreath? Why do we have a wreath? What is the tradition behind a wreath? And so we looked and you know what? The wreath doesn't exist in the original. Purple and pink. We make sure to get the colors right. I wore pink for today because it's liturgically appropriate. Purple and pink, we make sure to make the colors right. Do you know that in the original tradition, the colors did not matter either? Who knew? Right? We're looking at the things 
that have meaning for us, significance for us. We build entire things around these symbols, sometimes without even knowing why. So for all that the pandemic has taken for us, for all that it has broken within us, for all that it has challenged within us, it is also offering us a gift. A gift of getting real clear about what we do and why we do it as a church. It's time to say goodbye to doing the things that we've always done because we've always done them that way. And it's time to say hello to what do we need? What does the world need? What does our community need? And how do we meet that? so that we might grow in faith, in community, in spirituality, in love, and compassion. Now, that doesn't mean that none of the tradition matters. It just means that we got to pick it intentionally. Why this symbol? Why that thing? Why this word? Why that song? And pull it together so that we make meaning together as this community of faith, moving into whatever future God is calling us to do. Is it exciting? Absolutely. Thank you, Kimmy. And does it require a lot of us? Yes, it does. And it is work worth doing because it is a labor of love that will make us stronger and better and healthier as the church that follows Christ. Let us pray. Holy One, we give you thanks for the ways that you meet us in our times of trial, and for all the times that we've shaken our fists, that we've screamed out, that we've wondered, where are you, God? We thank you that you respond, I'm here with you. We thank you that there is a promise, that there is a hope, that there is a future for us to anticipate. And we ask that you would give us courage, imagination, conviction for the work that will be required of us. Help us to move joyfully, to claim with imagination and creativity all that can be when we are free from the shackles of always was. Shine your light upon us. Draw us close to your heart. In the name of the creator, redeemer, and sustainer, one God, now and forever. Amen.